Thank you for joining us this evening. My name is Chad Dowding, and I am the program director for the Howenstein Center's Cook Leadership Academy. Our program is dedicated to advancing leadership and professional development of some of GVSU's highest achieving and passionate students. Our academy works with more than 60 students a year to advance their leadership capabilities and to provide them with the training and skills to lead themselves and others in building a brighter future. Over the past several years, we have invited speakers to our campus to share their personal experiences and leadership perspectives. Our goal has always been to make leaders and leadership accessible so that we can all learn and grow from those making an impact today. Tonight, we are proud to take our Wheelhouse Talk series from the local to the national level and to focus on civic power, how each of us can engage in our community and activate the power we collectively hold in a democratic society. Before I introduce our speaker, or before we introduce our speaker, I have a few quick notes. I'd first like to thank GVSU's Community Service Learning Center for joining us this evening. They are here to support students and community members in registering to vote, and are also providing information about GVSU's Democracy 101 series. I hope that you'll have an opportunity to stop by their table in the lobby before heading home this evening. Please consider taking the first step toward being a powerful citizen yourself. In addition, at the end of our presentation this evening, Eric's book, Making Your you're More Powerful Than You Think, A Citizen's Guide to Making Change Happen, will be available for purchase in the lobby. Eric will also be on hand for a book signing, should you be interested. To our students in the audience, first, upon arriving tonight, you should have received a ticket. That ticket enters you in a raffle to receive a free copy of Eric's book. At the end of the event tonight, we will display winning numbers on the screens in this room. If you have a winning number, please come to the back of the room to collect your free book. Second, I hope this program will give you an excellent introduction to the opportunities available in the Cook Leadership Academy. Now, you have an opportunity to join us as well. Applications to participate in the 2018-2019 Cook Leadership Academy are open now. Brochures with full details about the Academy are available on the registration table in the lobby, and you can always learn more about us from our website, gvsu.edu hc. If you have any questions about the CLA, please come speak to, with me this evening or connect with one of our many student fellows in the audience. To all of our guests this evening, please know we appreciate you being with us to engage, learn, and grow from our speaker's insights. Now, please join me in welcoming Cook Leadership Academy fellow Jacob Begard to the stage to introduce our speaker. Welcome to the Hauenstein Center's Wheelhouse Talk with Eric Liu. My name is Jacob Begard, and I am a senior here at Grand Valley State, majoring in political science with a minor in anthropology, and I am a Cook Leadership Academy Fellow. It is my privilege to introduce our program and our speaker to you this evening. The Wheelhouse Talks highlight the philosophies and experiences of leaders from, very, uh, from a variety of disciplines, communities, and cultures. Our talks offer a space for reflection and celebration of the human endeavor. They encourage each of us to embrace our individual leadership ethos and harness, and harness our potential to benefit our community. Throughout the series, leadership values, perspectives, and traits are center stage. The Wheelhouse Talks provide us with an opportunity to engage with those making an impact today. In an expansion of our series this month, the Hounstein Center is proud to welcome Eric Liu. Eric is an author, educator, and civic entrepreneur. He is the founder and CEO of Citizen University, which promotes and teaches the art of powerful citizenship through a portfolio of national programs, and the executive director of the Aspen Institute Citizenship and American Identity Program. His books include the national bestsellers, The Gardens of Democracy, and The True Patriot, among many others addressing the topics of race, citizenship, mentoring, and imaginative thinking. His most recent book, You're More Powerful Than You Think, A Citizen's Guide to Making change happen is a call to action for Americans to engage in the democratic process and to understand and reclaim the power of citizenship. Eric served as a White House speechwriter for President Bill Clinton and later as the President's Deputy Domestic Policy Advisor. After the White House, he was the executive at the digital media company Real Networks. Eric lives in Seattle where he teaches civic leadership at the University of Washington and hosts Citizen University TV an award-winning television program about civic power. 
In addition to speaking regularly at venues across the country, Eric also serves on numerous nonprofit and civic boards. He is the co-founder of the Washington Alliance for Gun Responsibility and a board member for the Corporation of, or a board member for the Corporation on National and Community Service. He is also a graduate of Yale College and Harvard Law School and a regular contributor for CNN.com and a correspondent for TheAtlantic.com. Please join me in welcoming Eric as he shares important lessons on leadership and citizenship and citizen empowerment in this age of political division. Thank you, thank you. Thank you Jacob, and uh, thank you, Chad, uh, and um, uh, Gleaves, thank you for your hospitality. Your whole team has been remarkable here in uh, hosting me. Uh, at Grand Valley, and uh, and uh, we had a wonderful lunch uh, this afternoon with uh, some of the uh, Cook Leadership Fellows, and it was just so inspiring uh, to have this conversation with uh, uh, some of them are in the room here um, with, with these young people who are um, not just curious uh, but committed to actually building bridges, committed to learning uh, the full breadth of their own potential and power in civic life, and. Uh, uh, it was kind of thrilling for me, to tell you the truth. Uh, I, I go to a lot of campuses uh, around the country and speak at a lot of different venues, and uh, it's a pretty rare and special thing that you all have here, and I hope you know that, and I think many of you who are here for the reception beforehand uh, were here because you know that. Uh, but I really want to emphasize it as somebody coming in from the outside that uh, uh, not many institutions, not many public institutions, uh, make the kind of commitment that you all are uh, making here to this kind of cultivation of this kind of um, skill and values uh, and, uh, and character uh, that's required for uh, full participation in civic life. So thank you for having me. I, I wanted to um, um, tell you a little bit about myself uh, this evening and, uh, and then really open up a topic um, uh, about power and citizenship uh, and speak for a little while and then um, hopefully we'll have time for uh, Q&A or conversation in the room. It can be questions for me or it could just be things that you're moved to want to share and respond to each other uh, on. Um, I, um, uh, you heard my bio and the, st the stuff that I do, and I'll tell you more about Citizen University uh, in a moment, but I want to begin just by telling you um, how I'm here. Uh, and how I'm here is that uh, I am the child of immigrants. Uh, my parents were born in China. Uh, they went to Taiwan in, uh, during the Chinese Civil War. Um, they came to the United States in the late 1950s, uh, though they had actually grown up blocks away from each other in Taipei. They didn't meet until they were in the United States, um, and they met uh, uh, in, uh, in New York. Uh, and I grew up in upstate New York. I grew up in the Hudson Valley um, outside of Poughkeepsie, New York. Uh, and as the son of immigrants, I got this implied message all of my childhood. It was almost never outright explicitly spoken, but I got the message loud and clear. Uh, and the message was, Eric, all you did was have the dumb luck to be born here. <laughs> we did the heavy lifting, right? That was my parents. <laughs> we were the ones who took the leap, who, made the, who, who took the risks, uh, who put everything on the line. Um, and here I was, you know, how lucky is a human to be born in the United States in 1968, right? In the greatest, wealthiest, most powerful country in the world at the peak of its wealth and greatness and power. Right? I didn't do anything to earn that. Right? And so the kind of implied message throughout my childhood was, how are you going to earn it? Right? Uh, uh, how are you going to show up uh, for this community uh, in a way that makes not just the sacrifice that my parents made, but our presence here that makes it uh, something that we will look at and say, this has been worth it. Right? Uh, that was the implied message. And so all of my life, um, I've had this kind of ethic of be useful. I guess is the simplest way to put it, right? And there are many different ways and many different traditions that shape the idea of be useful, right? Um, as the product of a Confucian culture uh, that is always thinking about not the individual, but, but about the group and about how you serve the larger group and the larger body, maybe that's one influence on me, on, on be useful, right? In fact, those of you who, any of you who speak Mandarin Chinese uh, will know that one of the phrases that I most feared uh, being directed at me by my parents when I was a kid was meo yong. Uh, which in, you can even hear it in the way I said it, right? Meo Yong uh, means useless, right? Uh, you, you did not want to be called Meo Yong, right? Um, and then, you know, you get that for like sitting around after dinner when you should be putting away the dishes or, 
you know, or any you know, more serious level of thing, but you know, one wanted to be useful, not useless, right? Um, and that was one foundational layer of my upbringing. Uh, when I went to Yale College, actually, one of the first things that I noticed, um, uh, th th there's, a, there's a carillon, a clock tower there on campus. Uh, and on the base of that clock tower, if you kind of go around inside, there's a lettering kind of inscribed, carved into the stone there. Um, and there's a quotation uh, from a member of the class of, I think, I don't know, 1705 or so, something like that. Um, uh, and this is a guy you might have heard of before. His name is Nathan Hale. Uh, and the quote that is inscribed on the base of Harkness Tower at Yale College is not his most famous quote. His most famous quote, of co course, is... No, 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 this is a good civics quiz here. Uh, that's Patrick Henry. His most famous quote is, I regret that I have but one life to give for my country, right? He said that as he was about to be executed by the British who had caught him uh, as a spy during the Revolutionary War, right? Um, his second most famous quote which is uh, carved into this tower, is what he, something he wrote in the letter in which he accepted this final fatal mission. Um, and, the, and the line was, I wish to be useful. So, you know, here I am, kid who's been for 18 years told, don't be useless. You know, I get to college and look up there and there's this thing that says, I wish to be useful. I'm like, okay, I get the message, you know. <laughs> be useful, right? Uh, but that idea of being useful um, is in some ways a decent way to think about citizenship, right? There are a lot of dimensions to uh, citizenship and participation in a democracy and understanding our constitutional inheritance uh, and what it means to sustain the fragile, very, you know, evanescent institutions uh, under the rule of law. Um, and we can get into some of those details and some of those complexities, uh, but when you really boil it all down, it kind of comes down to be useful, right? Um, in other words, it's not just about you, and it's not just about now, right? It's about us, and it's about um, our posterity, to use a phrase that uh, the founders and framers used. Um, and so I, I wanted to begin with that, just to kind of literally locate myself, right? The other part of locating myself is just acknowledging, um, you know, in the less than 24 hours I've been here, part of the hospitality that I've received has just been people very interested in telling me about the texture of this place right, uh, of Western Michigan, of Grand Rapids, of the culture here, of the political culture here, right? Um, and some of those conversations have been about the lineage of some of your political leaders that uh, run from a, an Arthur Vandenberg to a Gerald Ford to a, you know, now represented here, I think, by Justin Amash, uh, uh, a very smart and principled uh, uh, member of Congress, uh, but also a culture that, um, you know, is embodied in, uh, you know, this fellow, right? Uh, uh, Ralph Hallenstein um, in, the, in the Meyer family, these, these people who uh, were shaped by different experiences, in his case, shaped by the Second World War, um, uh, is involved in the relief efforts of the Marshall Plan after the Second World War, um, learns a thing or two about the world, uh, learns, learns a thing or two about food distribution, uh, and decides to come back here and uh, go into business, right? And here we all are, right? Thanks to that, that set of choices. Uh, but that set of choices was not just about, oh, I think I'll do this for my career. I've, I've learned something about food distribution. I think I'll get into that for my line of work. Uh, that set of choices was about, I'm gonna be useful. It's not just about me, right? And the generation that came out of the Second World War had no choice but to remember and to know painfully um, that you could not reduce politics to just pure individualistic selfishness, right? That you had to actually have a capacious understanding of politics uh, properly understood as a set, as a weave of relationship and obligation, as this fabric of mutual aid, right? The Marshall Plan, one of the greatest things, not just the United States has ever done, one of the greatest things any civil civilization has ever done to rebuild and repair a defeated enemy who, had they not been defeated, would have taken over the world and wiped you out, right? To rebuild and repair, what, was that charity? I mean, it took the form of charity in the sense that it was gifts. Was it pure altruism? There was good, -hearted there, good heartedness there. But what the Marshall Plan was, if you understand it properly, was this recognition of the power of mutuality. This was self-interest properly understood. Recognizing that true self-interest is mutual interest, right? That when you help Germany and Japan rebuild, you create a market for American goods. That when you help Europe stand up, 
you enable the world not to fall back into chaos. That when you make treaty commitments of the sort that NATO represents, you create a world in which there is some promise of stability rather than just every other generation getting a world war. Right? Those commitments, that mindset, that worldview is of a kind that um, is not just a great thing that Americans should be proud of. It's a great thing that people in Western Michigan should be proud of. It is part, it's in the water here, that spirit of mutuality. Right? It's in the air here, this idea in this way that it's not just about you, that we are woven together, that we look out for each other. Sometimes people express that in language that is for Democrats. Sometimes people express that in language that's for Republicans. Right? It's not about party. Uh, it is about an ethic here. Uh, and I've really felt that in the last, uh, uh, in this visit here. And that's been very moving and powerful. So what I wanted to speak about today, um, having located myself and just kind of recognized and seen the place where we are here, um, is to talk about a conception of citizenship. Um, and I have this um, uh, simple formula, uh, which sounds like math, but it's not, but it's kind of a handy way to talk about citizenship uh, as a way to kind of define and encapsulate the concept. And it goes like this. P plus CH equals CI. And what I mean by that is power plus character equals citizenship. And I want to unpack that equation for you right now. So you heard during Chad's, uh, 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 dur during the introduction and Jacob's introduction, uh, I run this nonprofit organization called Citizen University. We're based in Seattle, but we do work all around the United States. And all of our work is dedicated to democratizing understanding of how power works in civic life, right? Uh, helping more people be more literate in power, to be able to look at, you know, to arrive in any town to arrive in Grand Rapids and kind of talk to people and understand, OK, who decides stuff, right? And, and who decides who decides? Um, and part of that question of who decides is about elections. Uh, but part of it also is about informal conduits and networks of power, right? Whether that's people power, ideas power, money power, the power of social norms, right? And our work at Citizen University is about naming and capturing these elements of power in a way that help people get over any allergy they may have to it. Because in America, a lot of people feel allergic, have a reaction to talking about power and naming power. Sounds like a dirty word, right? Sounds like if you're going to talk about power, you're going to talk about something like House of Cards or Game of Thrones, and it's all about you know, backbiting and backstabbing and people chopping each other's heads off, right? Uh, and that conception of power, uh, that it's dirty, that it's inherently um, sinful, um, is one that leads a lot of people uh, to take themselves, preemptively take themselves out of the arena. Uh, and my belief, and our belief at Citizen University, is um, that a democracy cannot thrive if large numbers of people preemptively take themselves out of the arena. Um, and what we've got to do is to get comfortable with naming, democratizing, breaking down, and understanding power. Right? That's our work at Citizen University. And so when I talk about power, and citizen power, I think it's worth defining the terms I'm using here. So let me start with citizen, because our, our organization is called Citizen University. When I say citizen, I am not, in this instance, talking about documentation status under the immigration and naturalization laws of the United States. I am talking about a broader ethical notion of being a member of the body, a contributor to community, a pro-social contributor to community, someone who sees herself or himself uh, as woven into that fabric of relationship and obligation that I spoke of. Someone who lives by an ethic and practices an ethic of mutual aid, right? Uh, in short, a non-sociopath. <laughs> That's another shorthand way of describing what a citizen is, right? A non-sociopath. Um, uh, and, you know, as we can get into later, there are times where the other definition of citizen under immigration and naturalization laws is worth talking about and arguing about how those lines get drawn and what those lines mean um, and what the history of that line drawing is like. Um, but I'm talking here uh, about this broader, more capacious ethical sense. And when I talk about power, what I mean is simply this, a capacity to ensure that others do as you would like them to do. Right? Now again, I'm in nice country. You know, people in nice, in nice places don't like to talk like that. I'm going to make you do what I want you to do, right? Uh, it sounds like domination. It sounds like domineering. It sounds like just, uh, uh, it, it, at the very least, it's impolite, right? To talk about what I'm going to make you do, even if I'm going to make you do it, 
right? Um, and yet, for exactly the same reasons I was saying earlier, um, if we are afraid to name it, if we are afraid so candidly to name it, uh, then we cede the field to people who are not afraid to name it, to learn it, to master it, and to exercise it, right? And so it behooves us all as citizens to become literate in this capacity to ensure that others do as we would like them to do. And in that sense, naming power that way, pa power is like fire, right? It, inherently, it itself is neither good nor evil. We can choose to put it to uses that are good or evil, uh, but that capacity itself uh, sits there, awaiting our intentions, right? And so in talking about power and unpacking this notion of power in civic life, um, there are three laws of power that I often speak about, and it's a good way to kind of get our minds around what's going on in our country's politics right now. So law number one is this, power compounds. We know this, we feel this in our bones. I mean, this is as old as humanity itself, right? You, you hear it in Matthew in scripture uh, about those who have having more and those who have not being ground down to nothing. Um, uh, you feel it because we live right now um, in historic times. We are living through the period of the greatest levels of income inequality and wealth concentration that this country has seen since just before the Great Depression. Right? And that's not a political statement. That's just a statistical statement of fact. We are living through a time where people are sorting and they feel in their bones the consequences of that concentration of wealth and opportunity. Um, but it's also in this age of media, social media and technology and network technologies that we understand the ways in which power compounds. Those who have some clout will get more clout. Those who have some following on Twitter will, set, will tend to get more of a following on Twitter. Right? Initial advantages compound in ways that feed on themselves. Uh, and our technologies of, uh, of this day and age accentuate and accelerate that dynamic um, in ways that are, for us, I think, unprecedented. Right? So power compounds. That is something that I think is kind of elementary for all of us. Law number two is that power justifies itself. At every turn, incumbent holders of power and I'm not, I'm not just talking about incumbent office holders like politicians. I mean incumbent institutions, incumbent social groups, those who have power. At every turn, those who have power will spin elaborate narratives about why it ought to be that way, about why, in fact, that is the God-given order of things, right? So long ago, before there was a United States, you know, in Europe and I suppose in Asia too, kings and emperors would spin elaborate narratives of divine right. I'm descended from God, so I get to be king or emperor, right? So step off. Don't challenge my legitimacy. I am the son or grandson, or I'm just lineally descended from God, right? And we as Americans can kind of look at that and say, ha, isn't that funny that people in Europe and Asia used to really believe that, that believe this guy, Charles II or emperor so-and-so, was actually the descendant of God? Uh, and can you, can you imagine that? And yet here we are in the United States, living under a variety of forms of our own kind of narratives of divine right, right? You think about the ways in which, in Silicon Valley today, right, in the tech bro culture of Silicon Valley, you hear over and over again, women are cut out for tech work, right? In corporate boardrooms all across the United States, women aren't cut out for leadership, right? Marketplace, capitalism is a competitive dog-eat-dog -dog world. You've got to have testosterone. You've got to be willing to make hard choices. You've got to be willing to kill people. Women aren't made for this, right? That is a narrative that is all around us every day. And it is as absurd as divine right. The idea that women don't have the stuff to make things work in Silicon Valley, that women don't have what it takes, the right stuff, to lead in our institutions, public and private, right? That is an example of a narrative of self-justification that it, it, it's like water to fish. Like we sometimes don't even notice it, right? How pervasive it is in so many of the ways that people talk in public and people talk in their families and people think about their own stories of their own possibilities. But it's there. Power justifies itself, right? Well, if all we had were these first two laws, that power is compounding and concentrating, number one, and number two, that power is always justifying itself, we'd be stuck in a pretty grim doom loop, right? Where fewer and fewer people are getting to hoard more and more uh, of the goods and make everybody else have to feel happy about it, right? Tell everybody else why they ought to be glad uh, that they're getting the crumbs. Fortunately, what saves us from that doom loop is law number three, 
which is this. Power is infinite. Power is infinite. I really want you to sit with this for a minute, because I don't mean this in a kind of woo-woo sense of, you know, if you just manifest it, um, you know, and, and, and wish it, that you can make yourself to be as wealthy or powerful as you want, right? I don't mean that. I mean simply, quite literally, that in civic life, it is entirely possible for us to generate brand new power out of thin air through the magic act of organizing. That organizing one or three or five or 10 or 100 or 1,000 other humans in some common endeavor requiring some common effort and common goals and common strategy generates power where it did not previously exist. Right? And that runs against a lot of the intuitions that people have. People, especially in a time of inequality, where there's this scarcity mindset, this fear of losing out, this fear of falling behind. In a time like the time we live in right now, there's a mindset that power is zero sum. Right? Those who have, have at my expense. And if I'm going to try to have power myself, I'm going to have to take it from somebody. I'm going to have to knock someone else down. Right? But the idea is, that idea, though it, you know, it's intuitive on some level, is wrong. Power is not zero sum. Power is positive sum. Right? When when you learn how to give a speech in public, when you learn how to organize and canvass your neighbors, when you learn how to lobby uh, your lawmakers, uh, when you learn how to um, organize a protest or a march or a rally, you haven't diminished by one bit my ability to do any of those things. All you've done is added to the net amount of power circulating in our civic ecosystem. Right? And you know, fortuitous timing. Here we are gathered on a day during which, for 17 minutes, the students of the high schools and the, and, and the public schools and the private schools of the United States walked out of class to demonstrate their power. Not only to demonstrate it, to generate power out of thin air. The Parkland students and the wave of student activism that has arisen out of that in the last four weeks is proof positive of the infinitude of power. These were young people who were being told by their legislators, by their parents, to sit down and shut up, to be quiet. You don't have a vote, you don't have a voice, you don't have power, we're not, you're not somebody we have to listen to. And now, they're, they're people we have to listen to, right? And on March 24th, when there are nationwide marches inspired by these same young people, um, you can agree or disagree on one aspect or another of uh, gun policy. That's not the point. The point is, these kids generated power out of thin air in reaction to the Parkland, Florida shootings. And in, out of their desire, out of their frustrated desire to get lawmakers and policymakers in Congress and in state legislatures to do something about it, right? So these three laws actually yield three imperatives for civic action. Uh, and I just want to name these because it's important, again, for getting our minds around what we're doing here when we talk about power. So if in the first place, power is always compounding into these concentrated winner-take-all games, well, our first job is to change the game, right? In the second place, if power is always justifying itself and spinning these elaborate narratives of why things are the way they are and why those who have have and those who have not have not, then our imperative is to change the story. And then third, if power is in fact positive sum and infinite and yet so many people remain stuck in this mindset and equation that says it's zero sum and I only have this little power and I can't generate more, then we've got to change the equation. Right? And there are examples all around us right now. We, again, are lucky to be alive at this moment, uh, living through this incredible surge of civic engagement that's unfolded over the last 15 months and two years. Um, we are able to see people changing the game, the story, and the equation. So what's an example of changing the game? Well, a guy who you have heard of who used this killer slogan, Make America Great Again. Donald Trump. I, you know, in case, I, I, let me be honest, I did not vote for Donald Trump. I'm not a fan of Donald Trump, right? Uh, uh, to, to put it mildly. Uh, but, 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 I, but I can acknowledge the ways in which he, his campaign, and the citizen-driven movement that flooded to the polls uh, on election day to support him were about changing the game. Donald Trump broke every prior establishment rule of how you were supposed to run for president, especially how a Republican is supposed to run for president. He broke every convention of what it means and looks like to build a national campaign, about how one is supposed to build legitimacy, about how one is supposed to get blessed by the right people and get their validation and their endorsement, about how it is that you speak to people and name stuff, right? And he changed that game, and he changed that game partly through 
using new mediums, like relatively new mediums like Twitter, and speaking not only directly to people, but in a tone and in a way that was native to Twitter, but completely foreign to a national establishment political culture. Uh, but it's even more than just his use of Twitter, right? It's the way in which he actually captured this incredible feedback loop between the power of his own celebrity and the yearnings of so many tens of millions of people who have felt lost, left behind, uh, or fearful about a changing America, right? Again, I don't like the outcome of the game that he changed, but he changed the game. He did not take the rules as they were given, uh, either in the nomination process or in the, in the general election. Um, and, you know, uh, again, uh, we can get into this later. There are limits to changing the game, uh, and he's running up hard against those limits as he's trying to govern. Uh, but he, uh, as a candidate and as a political figure, was a, was a game changer. And more importantly, the millions of citizens who flocked to his campaign were part of that change. Right? Well, what's an example of changing the story? Well, to me, uh, the signal, one of the signal examples of our time right now is the Black Lives Matter movement. Right? So you think about Black Lives Matter, and you think about five years ago, six years ago, eight years ago, um, I can count on one hand the number of public conversations by national leaders um, about unarmed, uh, about the police killings of unarmed African American civilians. I can count on one hand the number of times people in national leadership were talking about the structural inequities of our criminal justice system. I can count on one hand the number of time, number of times that national political leaders spoke about the school to prison pipeline and talked about the ways in which we are shunting large numbers of uh, brown and black children, mainly boys, um, into that system in which certain behaviors that get overlooked with white kids lead to suspension for black kids, leads to entry into the criminal justice system, leads to so on and so forth, right? I can count on one hand the number of times this stuff has happened. Why? Because we had accepted it as the normal order of things as a society, right? Some of us had accepted that kind of consciously and intentionally, and some of us bought into the idea that, you know what? Roughing up a few black kids every now and then is the price this country will pay for law and order. That was a narrative of justification. Sometimes it was implied. Sometimes, maybe in private, uh, it was said outright and explicitly. Uh, but others maybe didn't subscribe to that consciously, but still acceded to it, still let that narrative flow past them without objection. Right? And what happened after this spate and this string of killings Mike Brown, all the way to Philando Castile, and all the people in between, now has arisen a bottom-up movement of citizens of the United States saying, this is not the way it's supposed to be. This is not how government is supposed to relate to citizen. This is not how state is supposed to treat individual. This is not how the 14th Amendment is supposed to provide equal protection of the laws. Right? And that movement, called Black Lives Matter, has created a lot of controversy, and it's been the lightning rod for a lot of partisan debate and ideological debate. Uh, but to me, one of the reasons why it is so powerful is that it has changed the story of what we're doing in this country. It has made possible new public conversations about the way in which society, this society does and does not value black life, non-white life. right? And the idea that Black Lives Matter as a three-word slogan should be controversial um, you know, it's only controversial if you don't hear what's implied between those three words, right? It's one of those slogans that has a lot of implied pregnant silences in and around it. What, it, what Black Lives Matter is saying is black life does not matter as much as white life under our system of law and under color of law and should. What it's saying is that our institutions of education, of housing, of policing, of employment, do not value black life in the same way that they value non-black life. And they should, right? And so the answer to Black Lives Matter, if you're actually hearing it, if you're actually listening for what's being said in that new narrative, is not, oh, white lives matter too, or all lives matter. Of course all lives matter. But if all lives actually mattered equally, then you wouldn't have to say black lives matter, right? And so that fight, again, we can argue and, and debate about the, um, the policy preferences and the, and the demonstration tactics and the protests and what have you. But this is an example of changing the story that is just as potent um, as the Trump campaign was an example 
of changing the game. And then you think about changing the equation. Um, and again, we live in a time right now where you can almost pick at random from a page of the newspaper an example of people who are changing the equation, right? I, I come from Seattle, uh, where um, there's been a big fight, uh, and we, uh, the fight ended successfully to raise the minimum wage uh, in our city. Seattle was the first large city in the country to raise the minimum wage to $15. Um, that was a fight which um, wasn't just uh, at the level of policymakers and politicians and insider elites. Uh, that was a fight that activated low-income, low-wage workers themselves. It actually started in the neighboring town of SeaTac, which is where our airport is. Um, and it was airport workers, baggage handlers, people who clean the hotel rooms at the airport hotels, um, immigrants, women of color, poor people, working minimum wage jobs, working two minimum wage jobs, who in prior notions of the finite zero-sum nature of power had been told and had internalized the story and were telling themselves, I'm a little guy. I'm a person with no voice. I can't change this. I'm just going to get to my, I got to get to my shift on time. I don't want to get fired, right? And something shifted. And what shifted was that by twos and threes and fives and tens, they began to organize. And when they began to organize, people who had seen themselves as dormant and on the sidelines began to realize they were active and in the game, right? And so baggage handlers and hotel maids who had never given public speeches before, who'd never organized their neighbors before, who'd never canvassed and knocked on doors before, passed a ballot measure in the little town of SeaTac to raise the minimum wage to 15, which then had a catalytic domino effect on Seattle because Seattle was going through a mayoral election at the time. And so every mayoral candidate, every city council candidate got on the bandwagon, raised their hand and said, I'm for 15 too, right? And those low-wage immigrant women of color who worked those airport and hospitality jobs completely changed the equation by showing up, by voting, by organizing, right? And again, you don't have to like the $15 minimum wage, you know? We can have a great talk about uh, uh, the, the pros and cons of raising the wage. Uh, it's not about that, right? It is about changing the equation of power in just the way that the Tea Party did when the Tea Party came on the scene. Right? People today, I think, whether you are friendly or not toward the Tea Party, there's a narrative that's taken hold that the Tea Party was just Koch Brothers funded AstroTurf fake grassroots stuff. No. Certainly at the beginning, the Tea Party was as real and vivid a grassroots movement as this country has ever seen. Right? Again, your member of Congress is member of Congress, Justin Amash, Amash partly because of the genuine grassroots power and nature of that movement. Right? Um, and he's one of the few uh, out of that movement who have been sticking to their principled guns uh, about what a limited government libertarian worldview says you ought to do, whether that means you're criticizing Democrats or criticizing Republicans, right? But what, he's, what he was part of a decade ago when that movement began to take shape and take hold was a vivid example of people who, were, who had felt cut out, who had felt frustrated by the ways in which Washington, D.C. was making these taxing and spending and bailout decisions, um, and who decided uh, with the catalytic speech by some guy on CNBC saying, we need, a we need a new Tea Party, right? A CNBC financial commentator who was really ticked off about the, the, the bailouts said, we need a new Tea Party. And it was like lightning. All of these people in communities around the country started organizing, right? They changed the equation completely of politics in our country. People who had not been in the game, people who members of Congress up till then did not have to pay attention to because they weren't donors, they weren't frequent voters, they didn't show up, you didn't know their name, right? And once those Tea Party folks started going to town hall meetings, <laughs> if you were a member of Congress, you, you had to know their name. You had to start paying attention, you had to start listening, you had to start realizing which way the wind was blowing, right? I think we're in a similar kind of equation changing moment right now with Indivisible and the way that movement has sprouted around the country um, in resistance to the current administration. Right? So these ideas of changing the game, the story, and the equation are the kind of imperatives for action that flow from those three laws that I talked about in talking about civic power. But I've been spending a lot of time on the first half of this equation, P. All right? P plus CH equals CI. So I want to say more than a word now about the second part, character. I think one of the things that, one of the reasons why we oftentimes have that allergic reaction to power and, and feel like it's a dirty word 
um, is actually for good reason. Because I think if all you are is fluent in power, if all you are is highly skilled at the arts of getting people to do what you want them to do, right? If all you have is a great, really finely honed playbook for how to manipulate people and ideas and money and state action in these different ways, but all of those skills and all those capacities are untethered to any moral sense, are disconnected from any core sets of values, then what you are is in fact a sociopath, right? That is actually the textbook definition of a sociopath, right? Someone who knows how to move people and knows what other people's motivations are, knows how to actually move them and get them to do stuff, but has no actual moral core to be coupled there with that capacity. And so when I talk about character, I'm actually not talking about uh, individual virtue. Right? There, there has been, over the last generation, a, a movement around character education, uh, which is good. I'm glad for it. In general, focusing a lot on individual personal virtue, diligence, perseverance, honesty. Right. Um, th those are good values to inculcate and to, to live up to. But what I'm talking about in a civic context is what you might call character in the collective. Right? The values that make us pro-social members of a community. Contributors. Values like reciprocity, mutual aid and responsibility, sharing of sacrifice, deferral of gratification. Right? Values that say, in the famous first words of the book uh, Purpose Driven Life by Rick Warren, it's not about you. Right? <laughs> Values that remind us in different ways, it's not about you, are what I mean when I talk about character in the collective. Um, and, you know, humans are born as social animals, and humans are born, I think, not just to be uh, selfish, calculating, rational agents of their own self interest. Humans are also born, uh, because we are social animals, uh, to think about uh, how we are woven into that fabric and how we are influenced by and how we influence each other. Humans are born in a way that means that one of the greatest determinants for what people are going to do is what they think other people are going to do, right? And to put it very simply, a, a, a precept of ours at Citizen University is society becomes how you behave, right? So that too runs counter to some of the received mythology we have in American life because America is a land of rugged individuals. America is an atomistic land where I can do whatever the heck I want as long as I don't actively hurt anybody. Um, uh, and, and my selfishness, my self-regard, my self-interest will be canceled out by someone else's. And a million acts of raw selfishness will somehow magically add up to the common good. Right? <laughs> Th that's basically the story we tell ourselves about capitalism uh, and democracy. That a million acts of raw selfishness add up to the common good. I, I don't buy that story. right? Um, and I think the idea that society becomes how you behave is a reminder that you can't just be, well, let me put it in the affirmative. When you choose to be courteous or civil or compassionate, you set off a contagion. Just as surely as you do when you choose to be uncivil, not compassionate, discourteous, we set off rapid cascades of mimicry and imitation and the shifting wave of social norms. That's only, again, amplified and accelerated by social media. Um, and social media's algorithms, we are learning today, um, make you know, both the system hackable by Russians and make our hearts hackable by each other. We can make each other really mad, really righteous, really furious. Or we can make each other patient or compassionate or humble. right? Uh, and that the power of example um, is not just kind of standing there and saying, learn from me, follow me, I'm awesome. Uh, but it is rather the sense in which everybody has this incredible power to set off a cascade right now, right now, of compassion, civility, courtesy, kindness, responsibility. Right? Society becomes how you behave. Uh, another way to think about it, I once was driving along I-5, which is the big you know, north-south interstate on the west coast, um, and uh, outside of Portland, I saw there, there was this great billboard. Um, I think it was for a bike sharing uh, uh, service or something like that. But, uh, but the billboard uh, said something which uh, has stuck with me ever since and is a great encapsulation 
um, of this narrative of how society becomes how you behave. And the billboard said this, you're not stuck in traffic, you are traffic. <laughs> right? <laughs> To behave with civic character says, I'm not stuck in poisonous, toxic, angry, self-righteous politics. I am toxic, angry, self-righteous politics, either because I'm feeding it by what I say and what I post on social media, or because I'm not doing enough to reverse it. I am that, right? I am traffic. And civic character means recognizing that if you're going to be useful, usefulness begins with realizing the ways in which we set off these contagions of norms and behavior, right? Again, we may be wired a certain way, but people aren't born knowing how to do this stuff. And so the power of something like what happens here at this university in this center um, is that it is coupling the literacy and power with a grounding in character. The students who go through here, uh, those of you in the community who come to programs like this are learning about the elements of power, whether it's me talking about it in a contemporary civic context with different social movements on the left or the right, uh, or whether it's a historian like H.W. Brands coming here to talk about presidents or uh, you know, founders and other figures in American history um, who practiced and exercised power and had to kind of reckon with their own moral core uh, and the ways in which they were either living up to or betraying the core of their creeds, right? But it's also in the ways in which the fellows, the young people here, um, are getting asked to, getting invited to, getting required to actually do stuff in the world uh, that meshes the practice of power with the practice of character, right? That's citizenship. And we are gathered here today at a university not only so that we can honor the teachers and the learners who are part of this university, uh, but so that we can remember that every single one of us is a teacher of democracy and citizenship. Every one of us is a preacher of this civic religion. Every one of us, you know, I may be preaching to the converted here, to a choir, but every one of you is a choir master in turn. And whether that's in your neighborhood, in your block, in the businesses that you run, um, in the uh, social and philanthropic ventures that you do here in the United States or around the world, wherever it may be uh, that you bring your full capacities, um, our job now, your job leaving from uh, this evening here, is to think about, number one, how can I get more literate in power, right? How can I name stuff and understand stuff? Number two, how can I get more grounded and explicit in my sense of what constitutes character and to live with civic character? But then a big important number three, which is the final thing I want to say. When you individually, when we collectively take stock like that, when we take inventory of our power, this is a pretty powerful room. Right? You've got a lot of people here who are uh, funders and donors to this center. You've got a lot of people here who are connected to different parts of this community, different ethnic communities, different business groups, different uh, uh, social networks. This is a room that, you know, if you put your mind to it as a room, you could make some stuff happen uh, in Grand Rapids. Right? And the proof of that is you've been making some stuff happen in Grand Rapids right? uh, as a group. But if, is, if as a group we were to take inventory of our power, right? And really just catalog it. Like, how much money power does this room have? How much ideas power does this room have? Right? There are former journalists and current journalists in the room, people who know how to frame story and get stories into the mainstream of the media. How much social norms power is in this room? Who here is the kind of person who other people want to mimic? And who, if you choose to be a good person or a bad person, if you choose to be a sociopath or an empath, other people will follow you. Right? Who here has the power of state action? And that could mean that you work in government, maybe you're an elected official, or maybe you know how to pull those levers of the machinery of state. Right? You know how to grease that machine. If we were to take stock of all of these different forms and sources of civic power, and then also take stock and name the elements of our civic moral core, of our character, you'd get this pretty giant pile of capital. Right? Money capital, people capital, ideas capital, relationship capital, institutional capital. And once you do that, again, whether on a personal individual level or collectively, but I actually invite you to think about it personally, because there's some people in this room who I guarantee, even though what I said earlier, my law number three, there are people right now in this room thinking, I don't have any power. I'm just a fill in the blank. I'm just a student. I'm just a sophomore at GVSU. You know? 
I'm just a retiree who, you know, I'm living on a fixed income. Uh, I'm just a this, I'm just a that. Wrong, right? When you take that inventory of the kinds of power that you have and that we have access to here, then you face a very simple binary choice once you've taken that inventory. And the binary is this, shall I hoard or shall I circulate? That's it. Shall I hoard or shall I circulate? Right? And I want to tell you something that, uh, you know, I can give you a good moral, civic, religious, or even outright religious case against hoarding. But let me give you the practical case. Hoarding kills. Hoarding kills. First, it kills the people who didn't get the hoard. But eventually, it kills the hoarder, too. And that is the history of human civilization, right? Societies that are extractive, societies in which a few take from everybody and hoard and keep the hoard, you know, let's name some of those societies. The Incas, the Aztecs, the Confederate South. Those societies don't stand. They teeter over, right? Societies that choose to circulate, though, are the ones that have deep, enduring resilience. Societies that figure out what it looks like to circulate the power that you've just taken inventory of. That doesn't mean give it away and throw it. It means, it means just like this fellow did when he worked in the Marshall Plan. It means recognizing that when we circulate some power to war-torn Europe, it will circulate back to us. That will redound to the, America, to, to the benefit of the United States. It will make America even more great and powerful, not just in material and military terms, but in moral and ethical terms. Where for a three-quarters of, of a century after that, the world would look up to the United States and recognize, wow, something remarkable happened then and there. And the world we live in today is the product of that remarkable choice, right? But you don't have to go to history in the Marshall Plan. You just have to go to where you live right now and ask yourself, what does it look like and feel like to hoard? I know hoarding is tempting. <laughs> Again, in these times of inequality where you're feeling like it's hard to keep up, right? where you can be technically well off and yet still feel like you're slipping behind, or where you can be completely down, ground down at the bottom of the economic ladder and feel like there's no, there's no rungs within sight, right? Those are situations that make a person want to hoard and just hold on to what you got. But we have to have faith that when we circulate, it makes the body stronger. When we circulate, it makes the body stronger. When 1% of this country controls roughly a quarter of the country's wealth, right? When the Reagan era started, the top 1% controlled 8% of the nation's wealth. So that share has tripled under Republican and Democratic administrations. It has tripled, right? Imagine if a quarter of my blood was in my pinky. Right? Imagine if the, a quarter of my lifeblood, if the wealth of this commonwealth was hoarded by my pinky, right? For a while, oh, well, first of all, it would be kind of a, you know, my pinky would be ballooned grotesquely, right? I'd be standing like this because my pinky would be on the ground, right? For a while, my pinky might be thinking, I'm doing awesome, man. These are great times. I've never felt more alive in my life, right? But then within about 15 minutes, the rest of me would start shutting down. My organs would fail. I would die. And then the pinky would realize, uh-oh, <laughs> I'm going to die too now. Right? That, to choose circulation over choosing hoarding is not only kindness. It is not only compassion. It is not only altruism. It is not only compassion. It is self-interest properly understood. It is the very fusion of an understanding of power with a grounding in character. And for us as citizens, for you as big citizens, of Grand Rapids, of Western Michigan, of the United States, people who show up on a Wednesday night for something like this. You've got to go out there and make this ethic contagious. You've got to go out there and start showing and doing stuff to people, with people in a way that reminds them of the power of these values and the enduring strength of this way of living. And we've got to show people that the things that I'm talking about, I'm a Democrat. I don't assume that, you know, I don't know what you all are. This is not about party. We are in a time right now where we are called, <laughs> we really are called in a civic religious sense to live up to the principles of the republic. And to remember that when Ben Franklin walked out of, out of uh, Independence Hall in Philadelphia 
uh, after the Constitutional Convention had ended, and that woman came up to him and said, well, what have you all done? What have you all created? Uh, and he said, a republic, if you can keep it. Right? <laughs> we are tested as we have not been in living memory uh, on the question of whether we can keep this republic. Uh, and so whether you come from the right or the left, whether you identify as libertarian, as communitarian, as democrat, as liberal, whatever, this is a time for us to show up in a new way with each other, to start forcing these conversations, this kind of reflection, and to convert that reflection into action. If, I, if we do that, I actually am incredibly hopeful. If we do that, when we do that, um, we are truly going to make America great again. Thank you very much. <clears throat> Thank you. We've got some uh, mics set up in each of the aisles uh, for anybody who would like to um, ask a question or share a comment, and I'm happy to, uh, um, to, to respond. And if you're not comfortable getting up or, or if that's uh, burdensome, then uh, say your question. I'll just repeat it for everybody else to hear. Um, hi, tell us your name. Hello, thank you. I am Yohanna Lees. I am a former CLA fellow and happy to be here. I had the honor of having lunch with you today, so that was fantastic. Thank you so much, and it was great to hear you elaborate this evening. My question is um, around the idea of hoarding and the reasons why um, people might give for not engaging in um, democracy, um, civic engagement, and just something that comes to mind often, and I talked a little bit about it today, was the idea that oftentimes when we engage as people of color living in a predominantly white community, we feel like we have to rip that bandage off con continuously or often to get the point across or to um, express what our concerns are in the, the community. And so sometimes it's tiring. Um, and um, burdensome, and so a lot of the times that might be a reason people might not engage in, um, in those spaces. So I just wanted to um, have you elaborate on why people are not or might not engage. Yeah, uh, thank you, Johanna. And let me speak to that question um, uh, on two levels. Um, one, just the general form of your question about why people aren't engaging. Um, we talked a little bit about this at lunch. Um, you know, I think that the, they are the classic reasons. I mean, part of it is time uh, and people saying that, uh, you know, I don't have time to get involved in civic life. Um, uh, and my answer to that is you will make time if something's happening that speaks to your direct sense of self-interest, right? Again, those airport workers in SeaTac uh, who have a better excuse than anybody in this room for not having time made time, right? They made time. After their second shift, they made time to organize. After their um, you know, Sunday shifts, they made time. Um, uh, and so time, to me, isn't the compelling excuse. The other one that I think is more um, harder to grapple with and that requires uh, a different kind of uh, response and engagement um, is basically the, the feeling of, what's the point? The game is rigged, right? The game is so rigged, like, what's the point of voting, right? What's the point of participating in a system that is so broken and corrupt and rigged by cronies already, why, why should I get involved, right? And you hear that from the right and the left, right? In fact, that is what, you know, it's sometimes you don't think about politics as a spectrum uh, in the left-right way. You can think of it as a circle, right? And on that circle is where a lot of Trump people and a lot of Bernie Sanders people met, right? They were, they were at this kind of divergent part of a circle, and where they met was the game has been rigged, right? Um, and I think the answer to that has to be basically the talk I just gave, which is, um, you know, num number one, there's no more self-fulfilling belief than the belief that I have no voice or power, right? Once you tell yourself that, you make it so. Now, the, the inverse isn't necessarily true. It's not necessarily true that once I tell myself I'm super powerful, that I become super powerful. But you give yourself at least a chance if you have a different starting uh, uh, mindset. Right, uh, and again, uh, you know, I think if you put it into the context of voting, you know, here we are the day after a um, pretty uh, consequential special election in Pennsylvania uh, yesterday, where a congressional district that Donald Trump had carried by 20 points uh, in 2016 just went to a Democrat by a few hundred votes. 
right, by a few hundred votes. Um, and you know, a lot of people, people in, the, in both parties are spinning it for their purposes. Um, and Democrats are saying, I think rightly, that it portends a big blue wave that's coming. Uh, Republicans are spinning it as, hey, we thought it was going to be worse, but Donald Trump showed up at the end and he tightened it for us, so Trump still has, you know, uh, appeal. Uh, 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 however, they're spinning it though. To me, the real takeaway from Pennsylvania 18th uh, uh, district election um, is that there's no such thing as not voting. <laughs> not voting is voting, right? Not voting, not voting is voting to hand your power and your voice over to somebody else who wants to use it, be happy to take it from you and to use it for their own interests, often against your, your interests, right? There's no such thing as not voting. Um, and, and so to people who are disillusioned and feel the game is rigged, I don't say to them that, uh, that voting is the panacea, uh, but, vote, but there is no cure without voting, right? Um, and that if everybody who could, in fact, did, um, we would affect a peaceful revolution in this country overnight, right? Um, you don't have to go to the barricades. You don't have to have violent protests. You just have to walk to the ballot box. Um, that's the general answer. I think the particular answer that uh, you're asking uh, about uh, citizens and leaders and activists and catalysts like you of color um, in largely white environments um, who, um, when we bring up something like Black Lives Matter um, and are in a room where people uh, don't want to hear it, and people say, you know, why do you have to kind of, as you say, tear the Band-Aid off? Like, things were going great, right? We have kind of good race relations. Why are you stirring the pot? Why are you making trouble? Why are you, uh, you know, accentuating the negative like this? Um, and, you know, two things. I mean, you said sometimes it gets tiring to carry the burden of having to explain, again, the history of the United States, right? <laughs> to have to explain, again, the ways in which uh, white supremacy is not some kind of phrase I use casually and just to throw at somebody. White supremacy as a mindset is baked into the foundations of this country. It is baked into the Constitution. It is baked into the structure of an economy that was itself dependent upon, shall we put it, uncompensated labor. Right? So, uh, and it just so happened that all of those uncompensated workers were non-white. Right? That, that we can't acknowledge the reforms that have to happen in our democratic republic or in our capitalist economy without acknowledging the ways in which um, the original sin of slavery um, and the original kind of mindset of white supremacy um, are baked in in a way that they now must be reckoned with, right? But yeah, it gets tiring to have to say that over and over again, especially when, um, you know, even bringing it up evokes a defensive emotional reaction, right? And so I think there's two things that I would say we got to do. Um, one is to actually try to anticipate and, uh, and, and bypass that defensive emotional reaction. And so when someone says to me, why are you trying to stir up trouble? Why are you bringing up these, you know, these rabble-rousing radicals who are kind of upsetting the equilibrium of things? Uh, my first response to them in a serious, earnest way is, why do you think? Like, I actually sincerely want to hear, I want to invite you to step into my shoes or to step into your shoes, particularly as a you know, someone of African descent. Like, why do you think this? And you don't have to answer right now. Like, I actually want you to go home and try to sit in my shoes and try to imagine a day in my life and try to imagine how headlines hit me differently from how they might hit you. And then come back and talk to me tomorrow about why you think I'm trying to stir the pot. Why you think I keep bringing up this impolite issue. You know, why I keep on glorifying all of these you know, rabble-rousing troublemakers. Then let's have a conversation, right? There are other ways to kind of bypass or uh, uh, neutralize that Im initial defensive reaction. Um, uh, and, and a lot of these just have to do with a certain measure of um, just emotional intelligence, I guess is the best way to put it, right? I'm very influenced by this guy named C. Terry Warner, who's a retired professor from BYU. Um, uh, and he wrote a book uh, in 2000 or 2001 um, called Bonds That Make Us Free. He's Mormon and, and, and you, know, you can tell ways in which his book is influenced by his LDS faith. But it's not a Mormon book and it's not about religion at all. But as, a, as an elder in the Mormon church, as somebody who'd been a mentor and a teacher, actually a mentor to Mitt Romney at BYU, um, he just, and as an astute observer of human dynamics, 
he wrote in this book, Bonds That Make Us Free, about this universal dynamic of human interaction, uh, what he calls a cycle of collusion uh, that goes like this. I accuse you to excuse me. Right? We're all guilty of it. We're all guilty of it. Right? The example I used at lunch today, uh, I, I got to stop using this example because it's kind of unfair to my wife. But the example uh, that I use, I'll come home tomorrow to Seattle um, and dishes that were in the sink when I left will still be in the, dish, in, in the sink. And, and I'll say, hey, why don't you do the dishes? Um, and if she is a normal human, having normal human re responses and reactions, she will say to me immediately, well, why didn't you take out the garbage before you left? <laughs> right? Sound familiar, right? <laughs> Accused to excuse, right? Um, she did not take, you know, that, C. Terry Warner describes this as a cycle of responsibility shirking, right? Neither I who failed to take out the garbage nor she who failed to do the dishes is owning our piece of the failure, right? We're just each trying to put attention on the other person's failure, right? And this dynamic is unfolding right now as we talk about Black Lives Matter in the United States, right? Black Lives Matter. Well, why don't all lives matter, right? Or blue lives matter, right? And again, it's sort of like you're not really hearing me if your answer to Black Lives Matter is all lives matter. And I'm not going to yell at you about it. I'm not going to try to shame you for it. But I sincerely want to invite you to think about what it means. And let me break that cycle of responsibility shirking. Let me try to take on some responsibility for my piece in this, right? But I think that part of it is, but that is work. I agree. That is a burden. And I guess the second part that I would say uh, in answer to that specific part of your question about how it can be tiring for activists of color and just not even activists, people of color, to have to carry that burden of having to um, bring up the impolite topic of white privilege and white supremacy, bring up the ways in which that is kind of baked into different institutions, bring up the ways in which we are all responsible, not just you white folks, we are all responsible for it, but also to bring up this fact. And it's a fact. This is not an opinion that unwinding white supremacy liberates nobody more than white people. Because it is the people in the United States who think of themselves as white, who all their lives, who all your lives, have grown up in a structure that says, there's a thing called white. And there's a thing called not white. And you're lucky to be white. You're lucky because of who you get to know. You're lucky because of what you get to do. You're lucky because of where you get to live or where you don't have to live, whatever. And it's rarely spelled out that way. But we internalize this idea that whiteness means something. right? And so having these debates and these conversations about this topic is meant to liberate us all. But to the point that, boy, this is a lot of work for me as a person of color to have to lift up, I'm reminded that when Thurgood Marshall um, was before he, long before he was a Supreme Court justice, when he was, and even before he was uh, uh, the, the litigator who brought successfully the case Brown versus Board of Education uh, to, to desegregate uh, schools in the United States, um, when he was building the kind of uh, legal foundations for what would become Brown versus Board, uh, he was going into the Jim Crow South. He was going to the Deep South, uh, and he was building relationships. He was humanizing the very people who were dehumanizing him. He was getting to know them. He was trying to understand them. He was listening to them. He was breaking bread with them, right? Why? Not because he was a saint. Not because he just was, you know, uh, not because he lacked a moral compass. <laughs> Why? Because he believed still in the possibility of rehumanization, number one. And he believed that that was, yes, his relative special burden right now. He had to do a little, you know, one could look at that and say, Thurgood Marshall has enough to worry about, right? He's being forced to sleep in crummy hotels. He's being forced, he's being chased around by all these folks. He's being harassed by the Klan. He's bringing cases to, before courts and judges that don't want to hear it. He's got enough to worry about. Why does he have to go to the work of actually building bridges with white supremacists of the South? Because someone has to break the cycle of accused to excuse, right? And so I think about young Thurgood Marshall as somebody who, um, uh, is a standard like that for me, right? And few of us can live up to that standard, but all of us can aspire, right? Uh, and I think that's the, that's the job of all of us, whether you are, uh, wh whatever your racial background might be. Yes, sorry, I'm, I'll, I'll go faster now. I know we got to, <laughs> but that was a good deep question that I promised to answer more fully. <clears throat> 
Well, hello, my name is Paige. I am a current member of the Cook Leadership Academy. Um, and I was just curious. So as we all know, we're, we're in an age of misguided information, fake news, mm -hmm. misinformation. Um, how, how would you recommend us to be able to identify and kind of prevent these paths towards empowerment that are maybe fueled by very, um, I guess, extremist ideology, you mm -hmm. know, things which, for example, as we know, the Russians were meddling with a lot of social media and trying to get these groups of people to come together in order to protest for these very extreme ideas. Yeah. Um, and it's become a very divisive power. So how can we kind of kind of step in these in these shoes and say, hey, maybe this isn't something that you should take in the form of empowerment without it being condescending, without so, saying my idea is better than yours. You yeah. Know? So um, I think there's two ways. One of them is actually something you all do here. I don't, if those of you who have been participants in this progressive conservative summit um, know that, the, you know, and those of you who haven't heard about that, is something that uh, um, this institution organizes every year or every two years um, uh, that is explicitly about getting people to get out of their silos out of their echo chambers, right? To meet each other, to see each other. I mean, really to see each other, right? Um, and to learn from each other. Um, uh, I, I think anybody who has any capacity to convene should be using that capacity in that spirit, right? And your capacity to convene might be your book club, or it might be your church, or it might be you run a giant, you know, uh, a conference business, uh, uh, whatever it might be. To use your capacity to convene uh, in that way. Um, once you have convened people, um, I think a way to get out of this kind of polarized, uh, self-reinforcing kind of uh, fact and truth loops um, is illustrated by a project that we've launched at the Aspen Institute um, called the Better Arguments Project. Um, and I, I want to tell you about this. So the Better Arguments Project um, uh, grew out of this premise that, you know, in American civic life we are divided, but and while we want to build bridges and we want to kind of bring people together, um, I, don't want to I don't want to paper over the fact that there are real abiding differences of worldview here, right? And we need to be grown-ups about naming them and facing them and reckoning with them, right? Uh, and so one of the things I often say is, we don't need fewer arguments in American civic life. We just need less stupid ones, <laughs> right? <laughs> and I don't mean that just glibly, right? I mean, what does it mean to have a less stupid argument? Well, there's three dimensions to a less stupid argument. One is recognizing that America is an argument, that our entire civic inheritance, our entire creed is an invitation to argument, that we are not like China, where my parents are from, or Germany, where others have been. You know, we are not a blood and soil nation. We are a creedal nation. All we have, you know, when you came in, you had a chance to pick up a pocket constitution and uh, declaration of independence. Um, I, I didn't pick one up because I got mine on my... Uh, on my app here, my Constitution <laughs> app. Uh, but, but I encourage you to pick one up on your way out to remember the words of that creed. Now, it's not just the Constitution. It's everything from the Constitution to I Have a Dream, to the Seneca Falls Declaration, to Sojourner Truth's speeches, to uh, uh, Susan B. Anthony's speech at her trial for the crime of attempting to vote. Right? There are all kinds of documents and texts that you might think of as civic scripture that are a part of our creed. Right. And all of those texts and all of that language is an invitation to argue. Because baked into American life, kind of in our DNA, is a set of abiding core tensions and arguments that are not resolvable, that should not be resolved. Right? There is an abiding perpetual tension between liberty and equality. Right? If Justin Amash were here, he's a liberty guy. I'm more of an equality guy. Right? And we could have a good tug of war and have a good argument about how the dangers of a society that goes too far in the direction of equality, you get into totalitarianism, you get into communism, right? But the dangers of a society that go all the way here toward pure liberty, anybody gets to do what they want to do, is, you know, Mogadishu, right? That's a libertarian paradise, right? No, no laws, no government, right? Uh, no taxation. Uh, you, the, the reality of life in a republic is that we're finding places here that are combinations of these tensions. Liberty versus equality. Uh, those of you who are fans of the, the music, musical Hamilton, um, a Hamilton view of strong central government versus a Jefferson view of limited government and strong local control, right? You look on the back of your coins, e pluribus unum, right? Some Latin words. 
the fight between pluribus and a focus on our diversity, and unum, a focus on our unity, right? A focus on individualism versus collective responsibility. There are all these, there are about five or six of these core American arguments. And so a less stupid argument is one in the first place that recognizes any fight we might have today about the Affordable Care Act, about immigration reform, about taxes, whatever, is a recapitulation of a fight that we've been having already in this country from the beginning. Right? As I said at lunchtime, you can pick up the Federalist Papers and the Anti-Federalist Papers, and those two, those two sets of documents basically prefigure every fight we have in politics about these, you know, the role of citizen and government. That's one dimension of a less stupid argument. The second dimension is what I was alluding to earlier, more emotionally intelligent arguments. Right? Arguments where we begin by seeing each other, by humanizing each other, and by recognizing that we are all guilty of and prone to the accused excuse cycle. So let's all do our level best to neutralize that cycle before we start engaging each other. Right? Really, let's try hard right, to do that. Um, and then the third dimension of a better argument, uh, a less stupid argument, is one that kind of names the thing that I was naming during my primary talk here, which is names the fact that power is unequally distributed. And because power is unequally distributed, so is voice, so is standing, and so is your claim to make an argument. Right? Um, and so when low-wage workers in SeaTac were arguing for a $15 minimum wage, they were arguing from a power deficit. They did not have access to the major newspapers. They did not have to know how to get on TV. They did not know how all the ins and outs that people in the Chamber of Commerce and the business community who were fighting against them knew and had. Right? They were at a deficit in making those arguments. Um, and so the Better Arguments project that we're launching this year um, is going to be creating public events all around the United States. We're actually, in the next week or two, going to be putting out a public call to communities and institutions that want to host these events. Um, we're going to choose them all around the United States. We're partnering with a great uh, nonprofit called Facing History in Ourselves, which is an education uh, nonprofit. It's about kind of moral choice making. Uh, the Allstate Corporation uh, here from uh, you know, the Midwest uh, um, is our big primary sponsor in this. And so um, we're going to be doing these events, and the events are going to be trying to do what I just said, right? Trying to unpack those three dimensions of how to have a better argument um, and equip people to kind of go back to their circles of community. And I think that's, that's our only hope. It's doing it face to face. It's doing it in ways that are respectful of how someone might come to the worldview that they have. Um, it is, um, you know, the, the best bottom line, I think, that's important for us all to remember when we, when we started doing this project, we did some focus groups with young people, with high school students. And one of these high school students, one of the themes that came up over and over with the high school students was this. A better, an argument is better when the objective is not to win, but to understand. Man, like that is the, the, the wisdom of youth. Like, if you go into an argument not with the objective to win, but to understand, it changes everything, right? In Buddhist terms, you release the ego. <laughs> you release the self that has to win, that cannot yield an inch on this point. I'm not trying to win. I just want to understand what the heck is going on in your weird, crazy head, right? <laughs> you know, you sociopath, you know? <laughs> I'm just trying to understand, right? And that's a different vibe, right, than uh, I'm trying to dominate you, I'm trying to defeat you, or I'm trying to just crush you and make you, you know, go home like a baby crying because you've been shamed, right? Um, uh, but I think that's how we got to do it. And, and no place is better in, uh, place to do that than a, than a university with a public mission and with the ties that this place has. Um, so you all got to, you know, you all got to keep showing up for stuff like that. Thank you. Um, yes. <clears throat> Hi, my name is uh, Liam. Um, so you kind of talked about how society becomes how we behave, but I didn't really see you bring into light that the context of our behavior has strong reinforcement mm -hmm. signals and, and strong system dynamics. Mm -hmm. And so if the circulation of power is key to a really resilient democracy and, you know, is self-interest properly understood and, you know, the first line is like, how do we change the nature of power? How do we make power distributive by design? Mm -hmm. How do we design, how do we inject character into power so that it's natural you know, that was kind of the first thing you said about yeah. power compounding. Yeah. But yeah. We're, we're in a system where power compounds. Yes. It's going to be a very curious thing that makes that dynamic change. Yeah. So what a great question and a beautifully phrased question. You know, I think, how do we make uh, 
power distributive. Um, my friend Matt Kibbe, uh, who was the head of FreedomWorks, the major Tea Party organization, um, now runs something called Free, uh, Free the People, which is a, uh, an organization that uh, creates um, really dynamic, creative video content trying to sell millennials on the appeal of libertarian ideas. Uh, Matt Kibbe um, uh, would say, it's happening all around us right now. Right? The internet, the positive side of the internet is that it shows the power of distributive power. Right? Uh, and, and the fact that uh, anybody from anywhere can organize other people from elsewhere um, in a way that doesn't require you to go up to a central funnel um, and have a command and control um, structure uh, to make change happen. Um, and from a libertarian perspective, um, the more that we can encourage that, not only in the marketplace, but in government, uh, the better. But I think, um, I think the, the, the underlying essence of your question is that, just doesn't, that, that stuff doesn't just happen. Right? It requires design and intention. Um, and that kind of design and intention requires challenging some incumbent structures uh, of power. Um, and so, you know, what's the long-term future of capitalism? Um, if it's going to survive and thrive, I think the long-term future of capitalism, for instance, is going to look more like cooperatives than it's going to look like Amazon, right? It's going to look more like lots of small cooperatives linked and webbed up together uh, using the most interesting parts of the power of technology but relocalizing um, rather than a central monopoly, right? Um, through it that, that starts sucking up everything, right? Um, and I, I think, you know, this is happening in the economy. It's happening in public policy. Even the, again, I keep, I'm sorry I keep on using the minimum wage movement, but I'll, I'll use, you know, others. Uh, um, we are in an age where a lot of policy change is happening in this distributive way, this distributed way. Um, it's what I call network localism, right? I don't look to Congress. Uh, even if the composition of Congress changes, I don't look to Congress to legislate federally stuff that will trickle down to the rest of us. We live in a time right now where Seattle can decide $15, and then Kansas City can say, yeah, $15. And then Akron can say, yeah, $15. And then Nebraska can say, OK, as a state, we'll go to $12. And then it becomes a webbed, contagious thing. And the way that happened wasn't by accident. It happened because people cultivated a network of localities, a network of activists based in cities and states to exchange playbooks, to learn from each other, to talk about common strategies, but then to root them in ways that were relevant to the local place, right? This is what the Tea Party also did masterfully when they came on the scene, right? The Tea Party uh, is a demonstration of this kind of um, distributed, non-hierarchical, non-monopolized, non-centrally controlled uh, power. Indivisible, which I mentioned earlier. Uh, if any of you does, don't know what I mean when I say indivisible, this is a movement now that um, it started out with a Google document, a 20-page document that four young former congressional staffers wrote after Donald Trump got inaugurated. They were Democratic, former Democratic staffers, and they wrote this 20-page document that said, here's how you as a citizen can effectively put pressure on your member of Congress to resist Trump's agenda. Right? Forget about the content. content this is a content-neutral example. Right? But, but they put this document here. They made it a Google document, which just means that anybody can access it right? if you go on Google. And what happened next was exactly what they hoped, which is that the document went super viral. Like everybody started sharing it on Facebook and people emailed it to each other and thousands, you know, millions of people read the document. What then happened after that was something that was completely out of their plan and they had no idea uh, was going to happen. And that is that people in Grand Rapids, in Wichita, in Dallas, yes, in Seattle and Boston, New York and other, you know, uh, deep blue cities, and, and, but people in small towns started saying, that was a great document. You guys want to meet at the coffee shop to talk about what we do with this document? You guys want to meet at church uh, Sunday after, after service to talk about this document? You guys want to meet at the library Tuesday at 4 and talk about this? And all of these self-organizing chapters started springing up. Those four 20-something staffers had nothing to do with it. They were like, uh-oh, what have we made here, right? Today, there are over 6,000 indivisible chapters. The document was called Indivisible, which is why this thing got called that. You know, there are 6,000 indivisible chapters in every congressional district in the country. Um, and they are the people who've been showing up at town meetings now. They are the people who probably helped tip yesterday's special election. They are the people who are um, not controlled by anybody. Democratic Party would love to control them. Mm -mm. 
right? The DNC would love to get their list. Nope, right? <laughs> this is not a centrally controlled phenomenon. And I think, so part of my answer is it is happening already, and we need to kind of pay attention to where it's happening, where people are, are figuring out these bypass hacks. They're bypassing uh, uh, hierarchical monopolies all around us, right? And whether you see that in the private sector or the, pro uh, or the political sector or the nonprofit sector, take notes because it's happening. And if we can learn right now and kind of spread these methods, um, we will accelerate that, uh, that movement. Uh, so, yeah. <clears throat> Hi, uh, my name is Anna. I just want to first thank you so much for being here. Uh, your words about power and engagement are truly inspiring. So it's very motivating to hear you speak. So thank you again. Uh, I am also a Cook Leadership Fellow, and I'm also a Democracy Fellow, which is a new position here at Grand Valley, uh, offered through a similar nonprofit to yours called the Campus Vote Project. Yeah. Uh, so we're doing a lot to implement, uh, plan, uh, an, we are working to plan an action plan of engagement to implement in the fall. And I saw that your nonprofit offers a similar fellowship to students across the United States. And I was wondering if you could expand on what role they play at their universities to promote uh, dialogue and engagement among students. Yeah, thank you. Um, yeah. Uh, let me answer this question and then um, maybe take one more. Uh, I don't know, Chad, if you're giving me one more. Okay, take one more and then we can continue the conversation at, at the book signing and afterwards. Uh, but I want to be respectful of um, I could sit here all night, but uh, um, I'm enjoying this, but, uh, uh, but I want to be respectful of your, your time. So, um, uh, uh, yeah, we have several programs that engage young people. Um, one uh, is a program, um, uh, we have a partnership with the Truman Foundation, the Harry S. Truman Foundation. Um, those of you who have heard of Truman Scholars, these, it's a foundation that provides scholarships for um, young people to, who are intending to go into public service. Um, for, for their um, graduate school education. Um, and so we have a fellowship partnership with them where every year several Truman Scholars um, come and work with us um, leading different projects, uh, some on voting, but others on community organizing, others on racial justice or whatever it might be. Um, and they come from all around the country and, um, and from the right and the left. Um, that's one. We have another project um, called The Joy of Voting um, uh, that we do in a bunch of cities around the United States um, in which we are trying to rekindle a culture that used to exist in the United States at the local level of joyful, raucous, uh, creative participation around elections and voting, right? There was a day mainly in the 19th century, early 20th century, where it was like street theater and open air debates and dueling parades and concerts and toasting and bonfires and you know, all this stuff around elections. And a lot of that died away with television and, uh, and the generation since. But um, our insight uh, was that there's no reason why we couldn't rekindle this at the local level. Uh, and so we've been working with the Knight Foundation to, in cities around the United States, get young people, um, artists, activists, uh, interested neighbors, uh, to come up with ideas that are, again, locally rooted and relevant for generating this joy of voting, right? So in Miami, um, because Miami's a party town, some of the ideas were like, oh, I know, let's do a party, an all night party with the hottest DJ in town, and the only way you can get in is if you've registered to vote, right? <laughs> Um, in Akron, Ohio, which is not Miami, you know, they had a very different uh, project there, which was uh, a, a local theater company created these short little plays about local elections that they would perform on the back of a pickup truck that went from neighborhood to neighborhood, right? Um, in, in which, anyway, yeah, I give you examples like that, but young people are engaging in, in, in that stuff. Uh, and, um, and finally, we have a, a program uh, for high school students, y even younger, uh, called the Youth Power Project, in which we engage uh, um, young people from sophomores and juniors in high school from around the United States um, to uh, uh, come together as a cohort, but also to get mentored by a group of civic innovators and leaders from around the country who are adults um, and practitioners um, that we, um, we bring into the fold. So you can learn more about our work. Our website is just citizenuniversity.us. Uh, um, and um, uh, the last project I'll tell you about that I want to actually tell you by way of invitation um, we launched something last year right after the election, uh, 2016, after the election, called Civic Saturdays. Uh, and these gatherings are regular gatherings that are basically a civic analog to church. They're not church, they're not mosque or synagogue, but they are gatherings that have the feeling of a faith gathering um, in that we sing together, we turn to the stranger next to us and talk. There are readings of these texts that I was describing of civic scripture. Right? There's a sermon, there's more song, there's kind of a coffee hour that's about organizing and activism. 
And we started these in Seattle, and they caught fire. Um, and so now we're taking them around the country. Uh, we ourselves are, but we're also, more importantly, um, we've created a civic seminary um, where every year we're bringing in a cohort of a couple of dozen people from around the country, um, including young people. The youngest right now, I think, is 22. Um, the oldest is I I approaching in her late 60s. Um, and, um, uh, and we're bringing them to Seattle for this immersion in not only how to hold the space and run your own Civic Saturday, but more importantly, how to get steeped in this idea of a creed and, a, and an American civic religion, right? Uh, how to hold better arguments, how to get command of the language and the history and the values that go into it, right? And, and I tell you about this because hopefully it's captured some of your imaginations. Um, and um, if you're interested, not only come and you know, sign up or participate, but think about, like, I mean, <laughs> steal at will. Take our ideas and steal them at will, right? Kind of take these concepts, whether it's Joy of Voting or Civic Saturday or other stuff we're doing, and if you think, huh, I'd like to create something like that in Grand Rapids, or something like that could really do well you know, where my family lives in uh, you know, another part of the state. Um, it could be really good for getting young people engaged or getting you know, Trump supporters to meet people who don't like Trump, whatever. If you've got an instinct to want to take any of these ideas, um, I hope you will steal them. Uh, and, uh, and if you want to play with us while stealing with them, then, then you know, even better, let us know. Uh, but we design these programs in a way that's meant to be, uh, well, meant to be that kind of network localism, like meant to kind of take it and then adapt it in a way that's relevant to Grand Rapids, right? Because how you all do it here will look different from how we did it um, in central Seattle. So, okay, last one. Thank you. <clears throat> Hi, my name is Grace. Um, so my own take on your definition of power, I kind of view it as in order to get someone to do what you want, you have to show that there's value in your words. And so on a smaller scale issue that I've come face to is that I am of mixed races and I have a family member that just absolutely doesn't believe in Black Lives Matter. Mm -hmm. So I wanted to know, I guess, for lack of a better term, what is your advice on showing someone that your words have power and value if they don't want to listen to anything you have to say? Um, so I think it starts with just the basic psychological premise that no one ever got their mind changed by being told they were wrong or stupid, much less that they were being told that they were evil or deplorable, right? No, no, no one ever got their mind changed by being told they were deplorable. Now, they may in fact be deplorable. They may in fact be wrong or stupid or something, but, no one, but if your aim is to change minds, that's not the way to, to open the conversation, right? Um, I, I, you know, and I'm not kidding. I mean, I, I think, we, let's be real, right? There is evil in the world. In a, in a time where white nationalists feel emboldened to march by torchlight, um, we're not in normal times, and we need to be able and willing to name evil where we see it, right? And to name it, and to remember that it's not only torchbearers in Charlottesville who are white supremacists, right? Um, that said, I think the way that we persuade the persuadable begins with what I, you know, the, my running theme tonight, which is to rehumanize. Now, I don't know the particulars of your family and case, but um, but I think we've got to ask in the first place, in a way that is, is long before you get to anything about Black Lives Matter, um, to ask somebody how they came to the worldview that they have. You may know this already about this person, but if you don't, it's, even if you do, it's worth asking it again. It's worth inviting somebody to share the story of how did you come to see, the, what were, who influenced you, what shaped you, how do you pass that on, how does that form your way of seeing stuff, right? Um, and that's going to, you know, people will, people will surprise you <laughs> when you ask that question, right? I, I can walk into a room of, you know, Republicans over the age of 50 and make certain, white Republicans over the age of 50 and make a certain set of assumptions about them and then start a conversation with them and realize we had the same exact kind of formative experience. We had the, you know, you, like me, lost your father when you were a young person. Or you, like me, are the child of immigrants. Or you like me, when you got to college, felt like an immigrant because you'd gone to a middling public school, and now there are all these fancy people around you, and you felt like an outsider, and you had to kind of navigate a new country, essentially, right? But there are bonds, whatever. There, you start asking the question, you will find these cords of connection that are, I wouldn't say transcend, that are, but, but they are prior to 
political division, right? Uh, and if we can name and nurture those cords of connection, it gives you an opening then. It, well, it, what it builds is the word actually I haven't used all night, which is fundamental here, which is trust, right? I trust that you're not trying to nail me. I trust that you're not trying to shame me. I trust that you're not trying to humiliate me. I trust that you're not trying to belittle me. I trust that you're asking these questions in earnest. So I will answer them in earnest. I trust that you're going to be real if I'm real. So I'm going to be real with you, right? I trust that if I'm a little politically incorrect, you won't leave the table. But I trust that you will force me to stay at the table when I hear something I don't like, right? And that trust, you can't just walk into a room and say, tonight we're going to debate Black Lives Matter. Let us build trust, right? Because <laughs> um, people just get, they come in armed for combat, right? Um, but if you come in and you ask these more humanizing, rehumanizing questions, you make it possible. It doesn't guarantee anything, and it may, you know, I also don't want to kid you. Um, there are some bridges that won't get built, and there are some minds that won't get changed, um, at least not now, right? But, uh, but back to C. Terry Warner, or back to the traffic thing, like, the thing that we can do is set an example that... Um, that may, be, that, that may change that person a week from now, a year from now, two decades from now, right? Um, and, uh, you know, I, I think the, the, the last thing I'll say, um, and it goes back actually to the question prior, a lot of this is about trust building and relationship and seeing each other, and it is kind of this interpersonal thing. Um, I, I do want to close back on, this, uh, on the level of systems and structure, right? Because I think one of the risks that we have in American life um, is everything is individualized and personalized. And we are, we are kind of, as Americans, we are institution blind, right? Colorblind people can't see red or green. Like institution blind people can't see institutions. <laughs> they just think that, you know, the myth of, myth of rugged individualism, like I'm a self-made man, right? I'm rich and successful because I work my butt off. And it may be true that you work your butt off, but you know, I take it from a, no less an authority than a guy named Bill Gates Sr., who is the father of Microsoft Bill, who knows something about brilliant, hardworking people, like his son. And Bill Gates Sr. preaches regularly this line, there is no such thing as a self-made man. Right? He says, my son was smart and driven and willing to think unconventionally, but he had the dumb luck to be born in the United States in the 20th century after a war at the beginning of the age of computing. He had the dumb luck to be the son of a prosperous lawyer who could send his son to the Lakeside School, an elite private school that was one of the first schools on the West Coast to have a computer. He had the dumb luck to be a classmate at Lakeside with another brilliant, hardworking guy named Paul Allen, right? You think you worked your butt off? Yes, you probably did, but you have no idea how much you are the beneficiary not only of dumb luck, but also of institutions. Right? How does the Lakeside School exist? It exists because we have the rule of law. You know, I was talking to, to John here about starting, how he started a school in Sierra Leone. Right? Over the last 10 years, he has built from, from nothing, he and colleagues have built from nothing a school in a part of that country that had no, had no school. Right? And he was describing to me how if you want to get a school started in Sierra Leone, you, you, you got to grease some palms, you got to work the system, there's no rule of law, there's no bureaucracy in the best sense of kind of orderly standard process, right? It's all discretion and power and people rigging games, right? So for there to be a lakeside school that in, in 1970 uh, that would have this baseline of opportunity meant a whole lot of other things had been going right in the United States that we are blind to, that are like water to fish, right? And we live in a time right now, partly because inequality is stretching apart the kind of frames of those institutions, and partly because we have a disruptor in chief in the White House who, you know, in sometimes ways that are healthy, I think it's good to not respect the way you've always done Republican nomination processes, right? I don't think it's a good thing to just diss NATO and to say NATO is just a ripoff scam that those Europeans are putting over us, right? NATO is an institution born of a sense of mutual aid, born of the bloody, painful lessons of a world war that a generation of people like Michigan's Arthur Vandenberg and others understood the price of and the cost of, right? And 
you know, a favorite line that some of my friends on the libertarian right like to say, you know, freedom ain't free, right? They often say that to mean we gotta have a strong military, but I mean it to say we have to have strong institutions, which means we need to have strong citizens, right? And I think our job leaving here is not only think about this in a personal level, individual level, think about what I can do, but think about how can I affect systems and institutions? How can I shore them up where they need shoring up? How can I pour it on where places like this, at Grand Valley, good stuff is happening, right? But how can I shore up institutions in a way that another generation is gonna have a chance to have the dumb luck that every one of us has had here? So thank you so much for coming tonight, and I look forward to continuing the conversation. <clears throat> <clears throat>